Let's get up. Let's get on our feet. Let's give a good welcome. Cody. Man, thank you. You guys can sit down. Thank you. Uh, man, such an honor. Such an honor to be here. We have so much to talk about. Such little time. Here's the deal. I promise you, if you listen, the rest of your life will be different. Okay? You listen. Now, I've been married for 12 and a half years. I know the difference between making eye contact and not listening. And actually hearing somebody. How many, guys know, how many married guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. okay. Yeah. We know it really well, right? If you listen, I don't have anything on the screen. I want you, if you look up to the screen to see something, I want you to see your face. I want this part of this time to say all the foundation has been laid. My job is to now show you how sinful you are. And no matter how good you think you are, you suck without Jesus. It's awfully scary how bad we don't really understand that. So my job is to come in with my man bun and tell you that you're a miserable person. (laughs) Now you want to fight me. That's okay. That's okay. I'll let it down. Then Guns N' Roses starts to play and we have a different ball game. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, so my job is to get you locked in to understand that you can't do anything good without Christ. It doesn't matter where you're at. If you have 15 degrees in seminary and you've, you've memorized the Bible front and backwards, you cannot do anything good without Jesus. If your head knows about God's word and your head has memorized God's word, but your heart is so far away from him, you will not grow in godliness. And my mission here, what I get to impart to you, I want you to use your imagination. Most men don't use their imagination when they pray. We're kind of lazy when we pray. We can use our imagination pretty quick when there's a hot girl in the gym, though just going to remind you this whole time that you're sinful and you need a savior every second the rest of your life because it's not that I used to struggle with lust I man I like I pray even on my flight down here like God don't let a hot girl sit next to me I always love when like just a guy that just man I just want to hug just the ugly dude that sits next to me like God let him stink (laughs) don't let a hot girl sit next to me why I'm sinful. My heart rejoices in holiness, but at the same time, my brain can lust for things that will destroy my legacy. I can be spending time in God's presence and in His goodness, and I can forget in that same moment. I can be so tempted with this fruit of sin that will destroy my life, that I can walk away from him without even understanding it. But there has to be something in this sticking power inside of us because I'm going to speak to you as Christians. I understand there might be some people in here that don't know Jesus. I'm going to speak to you as a Christian. You cannot do life, a Christian life, without Christ. And you cannot become a disciple of Christ without brotherhood. So if you think you got this on your own, let me tell you, I was in the military for six years. I understand torture. I went through SEER school. SEER is survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. They teach you that solitary confinement's one of the worst forms of human torture. You think you can just walk through this life by yourself? You are setting yourself up to get tortured. And God loves you enough to let you fail. I think originally one of the greatest gifts that we've ever been given is the gift of free will. 
you have, like that makes life so exciting, right? You have the free will to be a winner in Jesus Christ. What is a winner? Somebody that's so disciplined in your commitment to win souls to Christ that you'll deny your selfish ways, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus every day. But before we get to that, like I, I, my, my mission today, there's a, there's a mountain in your heart, and it's so cool that Samuel was, was speaking on this, because I believe this 100%, there's a mountain inside of your heart that you're not addressing because you think it's impossible for it to move. Pornography, let me, let me, let me clarify something, pornography is not a neurological problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's not, man, my brain's that way, and it's always going to be that way. And like, Let me tell you my life. As soon as I saw pornography, I was addicted. I didn't know I was addicted. I didn't know King Jesus at that time. I knew sex. I got taught sex. I was, I was raised in a broken home. I wasn't a Christian. So as soon as I could have sex, I had sex. That's what you do as a man that doesn't know Jesus. Like, what else do you do? You fight and have sex. Like, like what? What else is life's meaning? So I started doing that, and then pornography comes out. For me, when pornography came out, it was on dial-up internet. So if I'm looking at pornography when I'm 17 years old, finally got a computer in my house, and you called my house, it disrupt my pornography. I was pissed. I get addicted. Right now, we have men in the church thinking that it's a, a neurological problem. You cannot fight a neurological problem. You cannot fight this, th- these man-made principles that you think your brain is the thing that we're trying to defeat. So we're going to fight things with the brain and how it's trained. You've got to fight spiritual problems with spiritual principles. If you don't, you will get destroyed and you'll fail and you'll fail and you've got to get it into your heart. The mountain you believe is impossible to move can only be moved when your faith is in Christ and not in man's ability because I know you have it in you each one of you has it in you to say man you don't know me you don't know why I struggle with opiates you don't know why I I struggle with alcohol you don't know my situation you don't know why I snort a line every once in a while you don't know why I get high to cope you don't know me I know Jesus and if we're on the same ground to say you know Jesus with me then you got to take your excuses and put them where the sun doesn't shine because he, here's the deal if we're going to say that we're men of God we better act like it and if you're going to act like a man of God you need somebody in your life that will call you out when you don't act like a man of God cuz it's just like you got to praise Jesus right for us That's easy to clap about in here, right? Until you're the one screwing up. Can you imagine a football practice right now? My team, OU, is getting stomped by Texas. So I'm listening. Like, I'm listening, but I'm also checking the score, right? And it hurts my soul. After this game... It would be, it'd be foolish for us to think somebody's not going to get up in those young kids' faces and tell them how to get better for the next game. What they're not, they're not going to Lincoln Riley is an awesome coach. He's not going to go in and say, hang up your, you guys quit football. You suck. We have no team. And after this, now OU is going to have one loss, and the coaching staff won't come in and say, you guys quit. We're done with college football. Oklahoma is no longer a college football team. We're going to focus on vo- women's volleyball. Hey, that would be stupid. They're going to grab their face mask, and they're going to tell them things they need to hear because they lost a game. Of course, it's a, it's a football game. Any football player knows you're going to lose games. You're going to lose games. Well, your losses don't identify your potential. They identify your need of improvement. And that's what we have to understand as men, because when we walk in that type of brotherhood, it is convicting. And we, got, we, we have to get to the point to where each one of us stops making excuses to walk in godliness. 
I'll tell you, as a, as a guy, I became a Christian when I was 18. I chased just about every lust my brain wanted. Not saying I got it, but I chased it. On my knees in my barracks room in Pensacola, Florida, after partying an entire weekend in spring break in Panama City, I met. Nobody led me to Christ in that moment. I had nowhere else to go. I hit my knees, and I opened a Bible. I don't know what page I was on. I just opened a Bible, and I was by myself, and I said, God, I'm done. And if you're real, I commit everything to you, and I promise like one thing I'm good at, the only, probably the only thing, lifting weights and talking crap. Those are the only two things. So like, like that's what, you, you can have it. I will talk crap the rest of my life for your kingdom. I will pick a fight everywhere that I go in Jesus' name. I didn't say that, but I said, God, I'll give you, it. like, if you're real, I'll, I'll tell everybody. And I met the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, his presence is greater. And I, I want you to hear this every day the rest of your life. The presence of the Holy Spirit is greater than pornography. The presence of the Holy Spirit is greater than any sex the fantasy realm can conjure and put inside of your imagination. The presence of the Holy Spirit is greater than fast food. Any lust of your brain out of control is sinful. I lust for my wife. Praise God that I get to have that lust satisfied. But it's never as... I love my wife. Be careful, Cody. It's never as good as the pornography that I watched. You guys act like I'm alone with that, right? (laughs) Any married man knows the understanding that porn is fake. It's not real. It's degrading to women. But there's nothing, man. When you walk in godliness, there's nothing more fulfilling for your soul. I have a seven-year-old boy. I don't want him ever to see pornography. I'm not stupid. I know Satan's number one tool to destroy a man's heart is pornography today. But I'm not going to treat him like he's never going to see it. I'm going to work like I'm, man, I'm going to protect that young kid's mind. But I'm going to have a conversation with him that if he has a game where he loses, he can come talk to dad. And we've got to get this understanding deep within us because everywhere I go, all around the world, the thing that I get called a heretic for, and if you read, there's some awesome blogs written about me being a heretic. I fight this concept inside of stubborn men. I want to say stupid, but they're just stubborn. Stupid is just more effective, right? I fight this concept that people don't believe that their brain, their physical body, their physical heart, their muscular skeletal system, their central nervous system is a part of God's plan for their life. That's what I get called a heretic for. Let me tell you, without your brain, let me pretend like that's a a thought you have inside of your head. Without your brain, without your body, without your physical heart, you go be with Jesus and you're not effective on this earth. Have you ever realized that angels aren't carrying out the Great Commission? The Bible never says that angels are the hands and feet of Jesus or the saints that are with Jesus. They're not the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth. You're the body of Christ. You're the hands and feet of Jesus. We have to get to a place to where we're stewarding our body with fear and reverence of a holy God. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me. Now, you should have a Bible. You should have a Bible, right? Like, hey, let's be warriors for Christ, but you forgot your sword? (laughs) Bro, like, sit on the sideline, bake some cakes. Then when you're ready, come back into the fight. Just blame it on my man bun. If anything gets offensive to you, sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. And I want you to pause while you're, tur- while you're turning in your Bible. And I'm just kidding about this. I'm not kidding about the sword, but you should have a Bible with you. It's always good to be able to navigate your Bible. I always say, man, if, you, if you're a man that wants to go to war with me for Jesus Christ, raise your hand. I get these guys raise their hand. Sometimes I'll throw my Bible 
and say, awesome, find Habakkuk. They start looking at the back of their Bible. I'm like, oh, all right, I don't want to take you to war yet. Our fight is spiritual. Everybody, I want, you to, I want you to write this down. I want you to write it down on your phone, on your notepad. I do not want you to forget this before we read this next passage. If you don't have a fear of God, if you don't have a fear of God, I want you to write it down, write it in your phone. I want you to meditate on it. Use your imagination. Use your brain. Drive your brain with your imagination. We'll talk about that so you can think of this. If you don't have a fear of God, you have lost the understanding of how sinful you truly are. If you don't have a fear of God, you have lost the understanding of how sinful you truly are. This was not a part of my message today. I felt like the Lord put it on my heart. I feel like you guys need to hear it because this mountain inside of you, it needs to move. This mountain inside of you is a sin that you've been feeding and feeding and nobody knows about. And you think it's impossible for the Lord to move it. But if you don't have a fear of God, let me tell you, this mountain is not going to get moved inside of your heart. Because... What happened to Isaiah? I've seen the Dead Sea Scrolls in person. The Dead Sea Scrolls is evidence that the Bible is true. You cannot make a statement that says the Bible is not true. That's stupid. You can with the Book of Mormon. I live in Utah. It's been disproven twice. But people still live by it. The Bible's never been disproven, ever. Isaiah literally wrote the entire Bible in one book. The same book was written a thousand years later. They have it to where you can see it over in Israel. It's amazing, and they found it. I mean, I wrote a book called Soul Con Challenge. If a thousand years from now another guy wrote the same book and didn't miss one word, that would be fascinating. Isaiah writes this book. Isaiah has this experience. Isaiah's a beast. He stands before God in Isaiah chapter 6. He falls on his face. What a wretched man I am. What a wretched man I am. He sees God's magnificence, and what's the response? Anytime you see this in Scripture, instant awareness of how sinful you are. And again, I don't care if you have 15 degrees in seminary. Praise God for those degrees. But if your faith is in those degrees and it's not in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you're going to stand before him and say, oh, Because how many of you would feel comfortable if we could take your brain out, hook it up on that screen, and show everybody the thoughts that you had in the last 48 hours? Just in front of us, right? Just in front of us. I'm not the king of kings. You guys, man, I was in the military for six years. I had to iron my underwear in boot camp, and they were whitey tighties. That's degrading. If the President of the United States walked in to check my uniform and to check my appearance and to check my stewardship of everything that I had, it would be a different level of regard inside of me, of fear and trembling, than if just my drill instructor did. Well, if the King of Kings in his throne room says, hey, Samuel, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hook your brain up and I'm going to show all of the saints and I'm going to show the angels what you've been thinking. God, God, no, I just haven't looked at porn. Here's the deal what we have in church. I mean, you got to hear this. People be like, man, I'm good because I don't watch porn. I can shut my eyes and see better pornography than most things show online. It's my imagination that drives my brain. So God looks at the heart because your heart, right now, you could think about Thanksgiving dinner. We're all hungry. You could think it. Your stomach will actually, we can't smell Thanksgiving. It will expand, increase its enzymes to digest a massive meal, and you can't see it or think it. You can't, you can't smell it, but your brain will respond to the meditations you have inside of your heart. So what happens, right? None of us would volunteer to put our brain up to where we could review it in front of the King of Kings. Jesus is not your homeboy. He's not your homeboy. In his mercy, he calls you friend. He adopts you into God the Father through the blood of Jesus, adopts you into his family. Jesus, never be mistaken, though. What what everybody thinks in the Old Testament were Joshua. I don't know if you guys have read the book of Joshua. It's an unbelievable book. One of my favorite books in the Bible. 
Joshua is a freak warrior. He walks up, and a lot of theologians think that he's standing in front of Jesus before he came to this earth. And he says, hey, take your sandals off because the ground that you're standing on is holy. Exodus 15.3 says, God is a warrior. God is not your homeboy. So if you go into your, your, your quiet time with the Lord and you plop your Bible down and you just talk to him casually, you've lost your understanding of how holy he is. So what does Paul say in regard to this? A new body that we're going to get. He, he breaks this down. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Say well-pleasing. Say it out loud. Well-pleasing. How many of you guys would say, I want you to be honest, that your thought life is well-pleasing to the Lord with sexual lust? Mine neither. Okay, so we got, <laughs> we got some work to do, okay? Like, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I love Jesus. I hate yoga pants. I love Jesus. <laughs> Gosh, the colors, and I just, <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so well-pleasing, all right? We're, we're, this is why we need each other. This is why we need each other. No matter what position I get, no matter how many followers and no ministry and all these things, you can still look at every single person and say, you suck without Jesus. Let me tell you, I've seen some of the people that changed my life fall because they were stupid. Heroes of my faith making stupid decisions, chasing something they thought would satisfy usually money or sex, thinking nobody would find out. Always the response inside of your heart. <sighs> Disappointment. We make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must, all bef we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done. Receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I want you guys to understand this process right here. I want you to take a break in this thought. You are not limited by time when you get to heaven in hopes that he's going to take a long time with me and he's going to run out of time and only get five minutes to judge your life. God's going to look at every idle word that comes out of your mouth. He's going to look at every action of your body and you're going to sit at the seat of judgment. That seat of judgment, let me clarify. There's two, it's a different judgment. He's not going to judge you and cast you to hell. He's going to look, and we know this, He's going to look at what you've done in your body and say, was it pleasing to me? Why? Because he bought your body with the blood of his son. I have a seven-year-old son. I have a five-year-old daughter. I wouldn't, if somebody came in and said, I'm going to kill this whole room, or your son, I'd say, see you guys in heaven. I wouldn't give my son for this room. He gave his son for a world that hated him. For you and I, he gave his son, and that blood on the cross, it purchased something. It purchased for anyone who believes in him eternal salvation, spiritually being born again. In the spiritual rebirth, also he buys your body. You know what he didn't give me when I came to Christ? He didn't give me knuckles without scars. Thankfully, after I became a Christian, I didn't fight anybody. Sometimes it gets really close. Uh, but... These scars are from before I knew Christ because some people just need punched in the face. I, I took it a little too far. He didn't give me a nose that's not a little bit crooked. He didn't give me a hippocampus inside of my brain that doesn't know what it's like to have sex high. Those things are still inside of me. My brain is still the same at that moment of salvation. My physical heart, my blood pressure didn't just magically get healthy in that moment. He doesn't just replace everything and give you a new body. He lets you stay in your sinful body. My only conclusion to that is because it's a constant reminder that every second of your day, you need a Savior. Because here's the deal. I've done this with women in the room. 
when I speak at like a Sunday service, and I'll never do it again. Because women lie about food, right? Have you guys ever noticed? A woman's like, ooh, this shake is so good, it's like a milkshake. And I'm like, have you had a milkshake in a long time? It does not taste like a protein shake. I like protein shakes for what they do. I like a milkshake. It just tastes really good. So I'll ask to say, hey, how many of you guys love broccoli? And women will be like, I love broccoli. <laughs> I'm like, all right. I'm not going to ask that question because it's neurologically impossible to love broccoli. <laughs> so then it just makes everybody want to fight. Like I've had some women stand up and say, I actually do love broccoli. And I'm like, oh, husband, take care of her. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding. It's, but it's a thought process. How many of you guys have eaten a Krispy Kreme donut? You guys know what Krispy Kreme is? Whoa. You don't like them? Okay, a, a donut, Dunkin'. I'm, dude, I'm not, I'm not racist. I'll eat any type of donut. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I love pizza and ice cream and donuts. And what happens in this process is you put that in front of me and I put that in front of you. Guess what happens to your brain? It gets high. It gets high. Guess what happens with a big bowl of broccoli and steam and no Velveeta cheese and no ranch dressing? Just broccoli. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It's true. Like, man, my son will still walk into the kitchen and be like, oh, who farted? Be like, oh, dude. Mom's cooking Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Dad, do I have to eat it? I'm sorry, dude. It's good for your body, and we're stewarding our bodies for the Lord, so sometimes we have to eat in discipline. Don't tell your mom that it tastes horrible. Just eat the Brussels sprouts. There's nothing in your life that you have the freedom to do without Jesus if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ. What's the word they use constantly in the New Testament? Bondservant. That means nothing that you, like, it's like, hey, man, why are you watching uh, that Netflix series where they're having sex and there's naked people on it? That's kind of like pornography. Oh, I like the storyline. Sure, yeah, it's cute. Um, you shouldn't watch that. Dude, I'm a man. Don't tell me what to do. You're not a disciple, if that's your answer. If your answer doesn't come with repentance and confession, which should be a common practice in all of our lives, you're not a disciple of Jesus. What's a disciple? You're disciplined in learning something greater. A disciple of Jesus is somebody who's disciplined in learning perfection. Does Jesus require us to have perfect actions? No, but does he call us to perfection? Yes. What's the difference? Vince Lombardi could tell you better than most theologians. Excellence is achieved by the mastery of the fundamentals. Understanding perfection is out there, and if we chase it with everything that we have, we might, we might obtain excellence. You'll never have a perfect game. You'll never have a perfect day. You'll always be able to rest in the fact that the cross is for you. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, he says, if any of you guys want to follow me, you have to deny your sinful ways. You have to pick up your cross daily and follow me. Now, I like, how many of you guys have a feast day? Do you guys have a feast day where you get to just enjoy and eat whatever you want? Praise God for feast days, right? I'm a, I'm a, like, my background, man, I'm a, a fitness trainer. I love learning about the body. It'd be really cruel of me to say you never get a day off from being excellent with your health. Jesus doesn't give you a day off from carrying your cross ever. Is it cruel? No. Your cross is your reminder that Jesus, his presence, his ways are better than any lust of your brain that you'll ever have. You will be accountable for everything you do in your body. Every time you look at pornography and think nobody's looking, you're doing that with your body and God is taking account. Every time you think of 
hate in your heart? Do you gossip in your heart? Men gossip, I think, more than women gossip. We're just as insecure. God takes account. And what I need you to think of, what I need you to process through is to say, in your life, I'm going to guess about 60% of your life is awesome. I'm going to guess there's 20% of your life that is so horrific you've never told anybody. And maybe, maybe 20%, that's not too bad, but you can joke with the guys about. What's Jesus say? He says, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul. The Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's everything that you'll ever have. Love him with it. So if, if Jesus walks in the room and says, hey, are you loving me with your blood pressure? You can't say, oh, that's not what you're talking about. Science today would say you're wrong. The actual definition of understanding what Jesus was referencing in Deuteronomy 6.4 means your heart being the entire center of everything that you are. The life-giving source of your body. So if you think your blood pressure is not important, you've been deceived. Not mistaken, you've been deceived. What's Satan's goal? To steal, kill, and destroy. The leading cause of death around the world is heart failure. If your heart dies, you're gone. Let me tell you, this army of Jesus Christ does not need a man dying before his mission is complete because he can't stop Looking at pornography. Pornography doesn't kill anybody. Oh, man, let me tell you. Oh, it causes, I think, that 77% suicide, that high suicide rate. I watched Ted Bundy's interview before he got executed. This process of how wretched pornography makes you feel. Fast food. If you think any part of your life is say, man, like God doesn't care about this part. God doesn't want me to exercise. God doesn't want me to do this. He wants all of it. He wants you to be healthy. Why does he want you to be healthy, body, soul, and spirit? And you see it repeated constantly in scriptures. Why? Because he loves you. That's awesome. It's not because he's mad at you. He wants you to be healthy because he loves you. And he's going to take you. This conference has come as you are. He's going to take you right now from where you are to where you want to be. Let me, you, you know this and you got to get it in your head. Pain is required in this process. Oh man, I can't do that. I don't have discipline. It's like, oh, you haven't read your Bible, knucklehead. 2 Timothy 1.7, you haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. What does that mean? That's like next level discipline. So if you say, man, I don't have the discipline to eat healthy. Nah, you haven't read your Bible. I don't have the discipline to study my word. Yeah, you haven't read your Bible. You have the discipline to do anything that Christ has called you to. You have the free will to do whatever your sinful man wants to do. It's your choice. Every one of you knows inside of your heart what that mountain is that you're ashamed of, that you've thought is impossible to move. And what's going to happen next is you're going to write that on a piece of paper and we're going to nail it to the cross. There is no sin that you have inside of your heart that Jesus is ashamed of. There's sin in your heart that Jesus is longing for you to get rid of because he knows the better way, the life that he died to give you is waiting. But you cannot live the life Jesus died to give you if you're, you're carrying this, the cross here and you're hanging on to your sin here. You can't do it. You've got to live as a crucified person to say my sinful ways are dead. I'm going to carry my cross daily. 
And I believe during this time, I believe for each one of you, there's something inside of your heart that needs the, this mountain that you believe is impossible. And this, this, maybe it started as just a little hill, and you've just built it over time, and nobody's known, and it's this massive sin. I want you to write it on a piece of paper. We're going to start worship, and there's crosses somewhere. There's going to be crosses. I haven't seen them yet. There's going to be crosses, and we're going to take this time to say we're going to have a time of reflection because you're, you, you cannot live in your life to say, I don't need to confess sin. Martin Luther, which we celebrate the Protestant Reformation October 30, 31st, he would spend in a God-fearing way six hours a day confessing sin, and he, would, he said, Eric Metaxas wrote this in his book, but he actually said this in his journal entries that he was surprised he could confess sin for six hours and still later in the evening think of sins that he didn't confess. So my, my role is to get you to say, I'm going to put this sin inside of me to the cross because it's faith in Jesus Christ that will move the mountain of sin and you have it. And afterwards, the, the ministry that I have the opportunity to lead is um, I, have, I have a, a friend and a, a warrior brother here named Ron. He has a table out back. My heart, I want you guys, if, you're, if you say, you know what, I want to do that. My, my, my heart for ministry is, God, don't give me the man that wants to just fill a pew. Don't give me the man that just wants to attend. Give me the man that wants to have the honor to die for your name. Give me the man that wants to go all in no matter the cost, no matter the pain. I want to see him. So we have this ministry built on a special forces mindset for King Jesus. And it's awesome. Because some of us, we walk through this life in King Jesus and we, we don't realize these mountains are there until six months or 12 months or 10 years down the road and the Holy Spirit says, hey, that is a sin that's stopping you inside of your life and you need to get rid of it. And you, you have this feeling of, oh my gosh, I can't tell anybody that because it makes me feel like a wretched man. And if you have brothers that are like hoity-toity and they think that they're all good and they talk about, oh man, I looked at ESPN too much this week. It's like, ah, oh, you're not going to feel comfortable talking about your sin. You guys are terrible people in yourself. Literally, you're, you're so bad, you sent the most innocent, perfect man to die on a cross for your sin. And I am too. The moment you get saved, you get redeemed. And all of a sudden, your identity shifts. And now you're royalty. You're a chosen race. But your brain still wants to act like the sinner that you once were. Your brain will never magically lust for broccoli. I'm sorry to tell you that. That's bad news. I hate chicken. I hate it. I eat it like twice a day. I gag sometimes when I'm eating chicken. I hate it. Egg whites. Job in his wretchedness and in, in, in suffering and his misery in Job chapter 6, he's like, and egg whites. Who likes egg whites? Read it. It's awesome. Your brain doesn't lust for things that are healthy for it. It never will. But your spirit longs for righteousness. And if you feed your flesh, you will constantly see corruption and destruction in your life. If you feed the Holy Spirit of God in your life with His Word and growing in faith, you will see the fruit of the Spirit. There's, it's the only way. And thank God, when my wife and I got married, somebody didn't give me an Excel spreadsheet of how to make a kid. I've never baked anything in my life, ever. If you're like, oh, you got to go in the kitchen, you do this, 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 and this, I'd be like, I'm out. Kid sounds really hard. But if you're like, hey, man, kids, all you have to do is this. It's like, oh, ha. I'm, you know, I'm okay at that, but that sounds awesome. The fruit of me and my wife's intimacy are children, if God allows that. Same with you. The fruit of intimacy with the Holy Spirit is everything you need in your life. But it comes through intimacy with him that is glorious. It's awesome. And it's better than anything your brain can lust for. But you have to be aware of it. And you have to feed the Holy Spirit of God inside of you and not your sin. And here's the deal. Nobody, 
there's sin in your life that nobody sees. And I want you to write it on this paper. And during this time, as they, they start to pr- sing a song that I've been worshiping for the last two weeks over a project that we're doing. And I love it. I just saw it on the paper before I came up. All you need is a grain of mustard seed. Little, little bit of faith, which was actually an illegal seed to plant in Jewish law, which is kind of a cool. All you need is faith the, the size of a little tiny grain of mustard, and it will move mountains in your life. You write that sin down and say, Jesus, I'm going to nail this to the cross, and I believe you're going to move this mountain. Let me tell you, I was a, I was a porn addict, set free. I don't look at porn. That's a victory. It's a victory. Guys, I've been married for 12 years. I don't look at porn. (laughs) It's awesome, right? It's possible. I hate chicken. I eat it twice a day. I hate it. Discipline is inside of me. It's not something I conjured up. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. It's not something you can conjure up. So take that time. Write this down. I'm going to pray over you. I want you guys, every one of you, And I'm the annoying guy that likes to pick a fight. I'm not going to fight you, but if I see you not walk up here, I'm going to ask you why. You have sin in your heart that needs to go on that cross. I do too. Let's pray. God, you're good, and we praise you. We praise you for this time, and we praise you that in our wretchedness, you love us, and that you see us, and you see every dirty, raunchy thing that we've ever done, and you still call us a chosen race and a holy priesthood. God, we cannot comprehend your magnificence. God, we worship you and praise you. Help every man in this room, including myself, to write this sin down and trust as we do it that you will do the miraculous and move whatever addiction, whatever sin that we have learned to love and that we get to be set free. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you guys to reflect on that. I want you guys to write it down and then come up here and put it on the cross.